Good evening, folks. Good evening. How was how was uh, effort everyone tonight? Excellent. That's good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Before we actually start um, anything, I always like to pray first. So yeah, let us all pray. Dear God, thank you for all your blessings you have bestowed on us. We are truly very grateful for them. Thank you for allowing us today to meet and share our knowledge and time with one another in this health class. May you extend your divine wisdom to our speech speaker, Dr. Graham Cates, so that he would, would be able to impartially, effectively his God-given knowledge to all of us. May he be blessed as he continues to bring his expertise to people who need them. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening, folks. My name is Alfred Knowles, president of uh, Ascension Men's Fellowship Group. And I would like to welcome each and every one of you here. Um, this is our first, I think, a Men's Fellowship first health talk. It's on diabetes and hypertension. This is our first talk and it will definitely be not our last. We would also like to welcome the, the good doctor, Dr. Graham, Graham Cates of Family Medicine Center, which is, which is on Blake Road. Let us all give Dr. Gates, a uh, big round of applause. Some of, of you may know Dr. Gates, and some of you may, may not know. Well, for all, all of you who actually don't, don't know, 
Nope. Okay, is a rock sound man. After Doc Gates was born in Rock Sound, E. Local Throat. After completion of his prime primary education in Rock Rock Sound, Dr. Gates uh, attended Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia and graduated in 1991 with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. Dr. Gates continued his education at the Uni University of the West Indies in Tr Tr Trinidad, graduating in 1998 as a medical doctor. Immediately after, Com completing his primary med medical training, Dr. Gates pursued his specialty training in family medicine in England and graduated in 2002. In 2003, Dr. Gates and his wife, Nurse Anita Gates, returned to the Bahamas and established Family Medicine Center which is on Blake Road. Family Medicine Center is committed to a holistic approach to providing health care for the entire family. Dr. Gates has two young children. Uh, are they still young? Because I heard you told me. 15 and 13 now. So okay, 15 and 13. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Joshua and Owen. He enjoys walking, diving, and boating. Folks, let's give a round of applause for Dr. Graham Gates. So good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. I am going to take off my mask so you can actually see what I look like. <laughs> and also, more importantly, you can hear what I'm going to say. So this evening's session is going to be more of an interactive session for you. I have a lot of information that I can stand up here and I could probably talk for the next 10 hours. But I'm sure that would not be obviously what you came here to get. What you came here to find out is some information about some very common conditions. But I'll tell you a little bit about me before we start to talk about medicine. So one of my passions in life is diving. I love going out in the boat and I love sparing. That is what I just enjoy doing. And I have two boys, as you know. So recently we went home for the crawfish season, lobster season. I'm always in Rock Sound. If you're looking for Dr. Kate's August 1, you can guarantee where I'm going to be, Roxanne de Luthra. So we had the fortunate opportunity of going home, took my family up there. First day we go out in the boat and we go out spare and we have a fantastic day. We got some crawfish, we got about 30 crawfish that day. Got some nice fish, some nice market fish, some mutton snappers. Took them back home, cleaned them up and prepared them and prepared some for dinner. So the next day turned out to be a little bit more of an interesting day. So we did the same routine. We get up early in the morning, get our breakfast, and we go out to the harbor towards Cape Luther, which is about a 45 minute uh, boat ride from where we are. So just off of Cape Luther, we're driving along and suddenly the engine stops working. Man, wow, what are we gonna do? My wife is sitting in the front of the boat looking at me, what are we gonna do? My sons are sitting in the back of the boat looking at me, what are we gonna do? I said, well, guess what? I have a couple of ideas. So one is that we know we don't have a working engine, number one. Two is we have food and water, and three is we have an anchor that we are safe. So let's be reassured that we are safe. <coughs> The second thing is that we need to do is we're going to have to figure out, okay, from where we are to where we need to get, which is to the land, is probably about a two-mile journey. I 
can't swim it. That's not a practical solution. So just maybe we could use the tide and the wind to help to be able to get us in towards shore. So I said, let's give it a try. Pulled up the anchor. We held up a big cushion that we have inside of the boat. And sure enough, the wind and the waves started taking us directly in towards the shore. In the meantime, I had called a good friend of mine who works for me, his name is Jay, and he's a paramedic. And he used to work at the island school. I said, Jay, I got a little bit of a problem, but nothing that's serious. Now, if you know Jay, Jay is a very serious person. He gets on the phone, okay, how many people on board? Do you have life vests? Do you have food? Do you have water? Do you have a VH radio? I'm like, Jay, it's okay, we are all fine. I just need you to contact somebody at the island school to let them know that we are drifting gradually towards their location. So 30 minutes later, after drifting for a period of time, we heard the boats coming towards us and we were able to successfully get in to the shore. So why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because it reminds us that sometimes in life there are some uncertainties, but there are also some certainties. And two of those certainties that I want to speak into as a part of my presentation tonight is that you will be born and you will die. Now what you do in between with your life is directly associated with the choices that you as an individual will make. I have no control over those choices. I can be the best doctor in the world, I can be the best lawyer, the best accountant, the best insurance provider, but guess what? If you don't take the advice that is given to you and use that wisdom that is given to us, then you do not empower yourself to be able to make the necessary changes that are going to allow you to be successful. And I'm not talking about just being successful in a financial way, but I'm talking about being successful as individuals, <coughs> where you feel whole as an individual, where you feel complete as an individual, where you are able to make a contribution back to your family and to the community. There are two major medical conditions that we see every single day in medical practice. So fortunately, I am blessed and I have a wonderful practice that I thoroughly enjoy. We have 15 physicians that work along with us at Family Medicine Center providing a wide scope of healthcare services. And on average, we have about 130 to 140 patients that come to our facility. Two of the most common conditions are that we see diabetes and high blood pressure every single day. So I'm going to do a little sort of impromptu um, survey. By show of hands, how many people know somebody with high blood pressure or diabetes? Raise your hands. I am. I have one. That is 100%. 100% of people in this group. All right, let's make it a little closer to home. How many people have a family member with diabetes or high blood pressure? That looks about 100%. Fancy that. So this conversation that we're going to have tonight is a very important conversation. It's an important conversation because, because it impacts your life, it impacts your family life, and it impacts our entire community throughout this entire archipelago of the Bahamas. And these are the conditions that are contributing to morbidity and mortality, which is sickness and death within our community. So the first thing to understand is what are some of these risk factors? Why is diabetes and high blood pressure so prevalent in our country? And I'm gonna throw that out to you to give me some suggestions. Why do you think that we have such a high prevalence of diabetes and high blood pressure? 
Don't all shout at once. Raise your hand and give me a couple of answers. Right at the back of the crew. Go ahead. Okay, diet. That's a big one. We'll come and talk about that. Others? Lack of exercise. Lack of exercise. Anyone else want to advance? One more for me. Stress. Stress and hereditary. Excellent. Wonderful. These are all big, big topic items that we want to speak into. And so when we look at risk factors associated with disease conditions within the Bahamas, particularly associated with diabetes and high blood pressure, we want to talk about lifestyle management, and we want to talk about what is our genetic predisposition towards these particular conditions. Now, these two things are the yin and the yang associated with diabetes and hypertension, and why are they the yin and the yang? Well, your genetic predisposition that you have associated with your family history towards diabetes or high blood pressure, you have no control over. That is what you, God has given you, the genes that God has given you, and that is just the heritage that you have been given. You cannot change that. As much as many of us would like to change those things, you can't. So you have to accept that. And if you do not know your family history, speak with the people around you, speak with your mother, speak with your father, speak with your siblings so you know what is going on from a health point of view. This is not about privacy of information. This is about knowledge of information so that you can then make decisions that are going to help you to reduce your risk. The other side is the lifestyle side associated with the predisposition. And we've spoken about a couple of very big areas as it relates to lifestyle management. So let's first of all talk about the back of the room, think over in this corner, nutrition, food choices. So our Bahamian diet, while delicious, affords us the poor opportunity of being very high carbohydrate driven, which means that it's full of sugars, and very high cholesterol driven. Both factors that we know increase the risk of both high blood pressure and of diabetes. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good piece of macaroni, all right? I enjoy a good piece of fried chicken. But that is not something that I have every single day. So there is nothing wrong with having some, but it can't be an everyday occurrence. There is a word that I use with patients all the time. It's the word moderation. Do we know what moderation means? Not elimination, moderation. And we have this concept that we have created and the construct that we have created within our minds of an all or nothing approach. And that does not have to be. There is room for us to be able to enjoy some of the foods that we have in our culture. But there has to be a counterbalance, the yin and the yang associated with our nutrition. So what is that counterbalance that we want to have as it relates to our nutritional needs? There is something which is called the plate method that I would like to introduce to you. And it's a very, very simple concept, but it is one that is incredibly powerful because it transforms the way that you look at your meals. And the plate method is used globally to be able to help people to make behavioral modifications associated with their diet. If you imagine you take your plate. Now, first of all, let's talk about the plate. So I went by a friend's house over the weekend. I would normally move a little bit more, but we got the camera on, so I'm gonna stay here so those people watching online can see me. So I went by one of my friend's house over the weekend, and the plate size that they brought me was a 14-inch plate. I said, good Lord, this is right for my whole family to eat off of. So let's first of all talk about one of the basic things 
which is the size of the plate. The dinner plate is an eight inch plate, not a 12 inch, 14, or I think, I'm sure it must have been 18 inch plate that is obviously designed to feed a family of 10 <laughs> rather than one person. So let's talk about the size of the plate. Once you have your plate, what we suggest doing is using the plate method. And the plate method is very simple. Half of your plate should be green. It should be vegetables. Vegetables are freebies in terms of your diet. You can have as much vegetables as you want in your diet. They have low calories, so therefore the carbohydrate content is low. They have low cholesterol, so therefore the cholesterol content is low. And their impact on your overall health from a microscopic point of view in terms of helping to improve your cholesterol and helping to improve your digestive system, helping to reduce the risk of cancer, particularly of the colon, are all very important. Now the other half of your plate is really the interesting piece. This is then subsequently divided into a further half, so you end up with two quarters. Now, one quarter of your plate should be some form of protein in your diet. If you are a vegetarian, that can be your tofu, it can be beans in your diet. Other things would be meats that you can have inside of your diet and making sure that you're making healthy choices associated with meats. So I get the question all the time, well, aren't meats bad for you? Isn't red meat bad for you? Should I not have this or should I not have that? You know, those are personal decisions that you have to make. But I'll tell you from a medical management point of view, we encourage people to have low fat content meats in their diet. Now, if you decide that you want to have a steak, remove the excess fat off the surface of the steak. If you're going to have chicken, cook the chicken, and once you cook the chicken, remove the excessive skin off of the chicken. Those are the high fat content points associated with it. That helps to reduce, obviously, the heavy load of fat. So you end up with one quarter of your plate, which is protein. The other quarter is your carbohydrates. So there's a lot of misinformation about carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are your sugar. So anything that is broken down into your body into a sugar is a carbohydrate. And some examples are breads, pastas, the macaroni that my mom does an amazing job at cooking, the potato salad, the cold slaw, because we put sugar inside of the cold slaw, right? So that is a carbohydrate, and the way that your body breaks that down is it simply makes it into sugar. So if you can just imagine for a moment sitting and taking a spoonful of sugar from the sugar pot and just literally eating it, that is what you're doing every time you're eating carbohydrates inside of your diet. Now again, there's nothing wrong with having some but it should be a small amount of carbohydrate in your diet. As Bahamians, we have it completely backwards. We have the three quarters of the plate with your carbohydrates, the bread, the rice, and the potato, and the macaroni, and you know what I'm talking about, right? And the one quarter is the vegetables. Well, let's change the model. Let's change the model in which we do things. And just like anything else in life, with practice comes perfection, right? And so we have to practice the piano. My son is learning to play the piano. Not that he necessarily enjoys it, but he's doing a fantastic job. He has a gift, I believe, for playing the piano. And he's been doing it now for two years. But one of the conversations that I have with my son, Owen, all the time is you have and these life skills, from a nutritional point of view, are things that you have to practice. It doesn't come naturally, but if you make it a habit, it will then become natural to you and your family to make healthy choices that are going to reduce your risk of the development of diabetes and high blood pressure. The other one is exercise. So let's talk a little bit about exercise. Does anybody know how much exercise we should be doing? Anyone? 
About 30 minutes a day. Any other advances on that? Going once, going twice, sold to the highest bidder. I guess that's right. All right. So we recommend that you should have 150 minutes of physical activity every day. So what is the best physical activity that you should do? We've got walking over on this side of the room. Any Swimming. other advances? Swimming. Swimming. Cycling. Cycling. Swimming. Swimming. Those are all absolutely fantastic recommendations. So you know what I tell my patients? Any exercise that you will do. Because most people don't exercise. <laughs> So it doesn't matter if you walk, jog, swim, you ride your bike, you turn on the music and you dance inside of the house, you go in the yard and you mow the grass, clean the weeds, clean the windows, whatever it is that you are doing as a part of your physical activity is an important exercise. And so whatever it is that you want to do as a part of your regular exercise. And the other thing that I'll say just before I take your question is that remember that exercise is cumulative. It's not a all or nothing. You can do 10 minutes in the morning and you can do 15 minutes in the evening. And that adds up to the amount of physical activity. Some of the other very simple ways in which you can exercise is, don't take the elevator at work. It's okay not to take the elevator. You can walk the stairs. They are there for a reason, not just for a fire or an emergency. I never take the stairs in my office, and I have three buildings that are three stories. I, I mean, I always take the stairs in my office and never take the elevator. The other thing is when you park, you know, park, you don't need to park right outside of the door. Park maybe about five spaces down the road so you can walk a little bit to get into the office. You had a question. My workplace, gardening. Beautiful. Oh, my God. Gardening is fantastic, absolutely great activity. My dad is 93 years old, and that is his primary form of activity, gardening. He's out there in the morning, he's out there in the evening, he's moving around, he's stretching, he's watering the plants, he's picking up the weeds, getting all of that movement and physical activity. And so these are things that are obviously essentially important as a part of maintaining our overall health. When you look at nutrition, and when you look at exercise, if you have poor nutrition and you have poor exercise, what is the resulting, the result of those two factors? High risk. High risk you're increasing your risk of diabetes, of high blood pressure. I'll give you a quick story of a patient that I had in just yesterday, a young man, 34 years old, came in for the first time to have his annual physical done. And if you have not had your annual physical done, please see your primary care physician, your health care provider, and make sure that you get your yearly checkups done. These are important. It's maintenance on your vehicle is checking your bank account and seeing if you have money inside of your bank account. Because if you go to the bank and you put in the card and nothing comes out, you got a problem. Your health is the same. You have to manage it. And managing your health requires that you get an annual physical done every year. Your blood tests, your mammogram, your pap smears, all of these are things that are important for your health because if there are things that we can identify early and treat, and hence my story. 34-year-old gentleman comes in for the first time to see me. We go through his medical history, do his physical examination, blood pressure 220 over 140. A normal blood pressure, just for those of you who do not know, is 120 over 80. All right? This is a young, quote-unquote, healthy member of our community walking around who has extreme hypertension and had absolutely no idea that he had high blood pressure. So where does that conversation lead us? That leads us to the fact that you have to check. If you do not check, you will not know. 
you must get your checkup so that you know what is going on. When we talk about high blood pressure, there are important numbers that you need to know. And I tell my patients all the time, when you go to the doctor, don't just let the doctor tell you everything is normal. No, I want to know what the numbers are. Let me see it in black and white. I want a copy of my results so I can look at them myself. Google is there for a reason. Google allows you as an individual to be able to review things and then empowers you to be able to make decisions. Now, you have to be careful with Dr. Google because everything you read can mean you're dying, right? But that's not the case, and I see that every day. Oh my God, my head is hurting. I must be having a stroke. No, you just have a headache. You'll be okay. Drink some water. Take a couple of diet and I'll, I'll see you in the morning. But know your numbers. Know your information. Know what your blood pressure is. So what is a normal blood pressure? A normal blood pressure is a blood pressure that is less than 120 over 80. If your blood pressure is above 120 over 80, that is cause for concern, okay? That is something that requires follow-up, it requires management, and we'll talk a little bit more about management as we go along in the conversation. If your blood sugar is above 100 on a fasting blood sample, which means that you've had nothing to eat or drink for 10 p.m. the night before, you go to your doctor's office or your healthcare provider's office in the lab and they take a blood sample from your arm and they test it and your blood sugar is above 100, that's a concern. That is a warning sign. That is the yellow light flashing on the dashboard of your car as you're driving down JFK towards the airport to pick up Grammy for the, from the airport as saying, hey, look, stop and check your vehicle because you ain't gonna make it to see Grammy at the airport if you don't stop and check your vehicle. And somebody else can have to pick up Grammy. So check, know your numbers, know where you are. Once that blood sugar and that blood pressure reaches a certain point, there are certain things that you have to do. These are non-negotiables. So we are in a place of faith. I am a man of faith. I am an elder within my church community. There's only one way to have a relationship with God, and that is through Jesus Christ, our Savior. It doesn't work any other way. Your health is the same. Your health requires that you have the information so that you can be proactive and make decisions. And if you are going to take the ostrich burying your head in the sand approach that I see all the time, that still work. That is not what God invites us into. God invites us into a life of fullness, a life of wholeness. He has given me expertise in the world of medicine and giftedness in medicine to be able to say, hey, look, here is what the recommendations are, and these are why these recommendations are for me. Do you know the reality is is that the commonest reason that people in our beautiful Bahamas develop chronic kidney disease or renal failure is because of one simple reason. They are not willing to take their medications to control their high blood pressure or their diabetes. And in conjunction with not not willing to make the lifestyle changes that are required to be able to control and regulate their blood sugars or their blood pressures. So once you've seen your healthcare provider, you've had your assessment, they've talked about your risk factors associated with the diabetes and the high blood pressure. The next step is then obviously, well, what do we do? What do we do from here? So there are lots of misconceptions that have been created culturally in our community. And I'm going to address some of those misconceptions. One of the biggest misconceptions that I hear from patients all the time is that I take in no medicine. Straight up, I take in no medicine. Now, I'll do anything else that you tell me to do, but I'm not taking any medication. So to me, this is putting on the blinders and burying your head in the sand. And saying to me as a professional, and I use this example to people, I said, in the event that you had a litigation brought against you and you went to your lawyer, 
and your lawyer said to you, here is what my recommendation is and the steps that you need to take to be able to get yourself out of this situation that you find yourself in. My good friend over here, a teacher. I love teachers because they have given me so many gifts in my life. Thank you for your contribution and any others that are in the room. Teachers show up to school, they provide you with information and teach you how to do mathematics. One plus one is two plus two is ten plus ten is now there's nowhere in the world that you can go that's going to change that. I don't care where you go. You could go out of this world. You could go to Mars and try to come up with a different formula. It doesn't exist. And the same is true when it comes to our health care and the management of our health care. There are some times where lifestyle changes and lifestyle modification diet, through exercise, through weight reduction, through changes in lifestyle such as stopping drinking and smoking are just not enough to be able to manage patients that have hypertension or that have diabetes. And this is the role of medical management or the use of medications associated with controlling these conditions. And there are a huge range of medications that are available. Not one size fits all. Everybody is unique. Everybody has their own personal characteristics. So I may decide for Mr. John Doe to give him X medicine because that is the best for his condition. The same person who has high blood pressure, Jane Doe, I may decide to give a completely different medication to. The other very important thing as healthcare providers is you have to have a relationship with your healthcare provider. If you don't have a relationship with your healthcare provider, one is you don't trust them, and trust is critically important in any relationship, and two is that you're not going to be compliant. You're not going to be listening to what I have to say because we don't have that level of rapport that you trust me and I am going to give you the most accurate information that you need to be able to look after yourself. Medications that are used in the treatment of diabetes and high blood pressure, yes, they can have side effects just as everything else. When is the last time you went into your vehicle, started your vehicle and did put on your seatbelt? You think that's a good idea? Probably not in NASA, maybe if you were in Eleuthera, you might get away with it. Wouldn't recommend it, but I do it when I go home, I'll be honest with you. I don't wear my seatbelt like I should. But you have to look at the benefits, the pros and the cons, and have a conversation with your healthcare provider associated with what are the advantages of me doing this. And am I gonna put my seatbelt on today and protect myself protect myself from long-term complications associated with diabetes and high blood pressure? Or am I going to throw caution to the wind and I'm going to say, look, you know what? Today ain't a day, man. I ain't fooling with this today. I ain't wearing no seatbelt today. I ain't taking no medicine today. I'm just going to give it a go. Throw it up in the wind. See what happens. Our God is not a God of chaos. Our God is a God of organization, of processes of systems and he has created us in his likeness and his image. We have to accept responsibility for each and every action that we take and recognize that for each and every action there is a reaction. Now are you willing to live with the consequences of the reaction if you are not compliant with what the recommendations are. Hypertension and diabetes are bread and butter in medicine. Out of my patients that I see on a daily basis, 50%, 50% of them are either diabetic or hypertensive. Okay. 
What that means to me is that there is a systemic problem that is causing our country to head in this continued direction. And it is lifestyle, as we've spoken about, the modification of diet and exercise and good nutrition. And it is also our genetic predisposition that we have towards the development of chronic medical conditions. The last piece that I want us to take a few minutes to just speak into is the sobering piece of medicine, which is death. Unfortunately, we have a high incidence of young people within our country dying. And one of the primary reasons for that is because of uncontrolled diabetes and uncontrolled hypertension. Leg amputations. We have within our country one of the highest levels of diabetic amputations in the entire world, globally. You want to save people's limbs. You're not in the business of chopping people's legs off when they get sick with diabetes. We want you to be able to walk. We want you to be whole. And it is through a combined relationship with your doctor, yourself, that you can reduce your risk of complications. I've already mentioned to you, if you take your from the top of your head to the very bottom of your feet, and everything else in between. Hypertension and diabetes, which is uncontrolled, affects every single organ system in your body. There's not one organ system that is spared. But guess what? It doesn't have to be that way. Because if you can prevent it, or if you identify that you have it, and you then subsequently mitigate your risk of complications by being compliant with the recommendations that your doctor or healthcare professionals have for you, you can have a normal life, you can have a normal quality of life. You don't have to end up with chronic complications, eye disease, blindness, heart disease, heart attacks, amputations, kidney disease, going on dialysis having complications associated with dialysis. We have over 300 people right now on dialysis. In our population of 385 people, do the math, and it's huge. But the good news is that we're here tonight to learn. We're gonna be the ones that are not gonna bury our heads in the sand. We're gonna be the ones to be informed. We're gonna be the ones to say, hey, look, I am going to make a difference. Because guess what? If we, every single person inside of this room, takes responsibility for their health, and then speaks to their family members about taking responsibilities for their health, guess what? We can have a healthier Bahamas. I think the church as a whole has a huge role to play in getting the message out about health and wellness. And the health and wellness we're talking about is just not physical wellness. While that is important, we're also talking about spiritual wellness, financial wellness, emotional wellness, and social wellness. All of the five components associated with our general health and well-being. As I said to you earlier, I could talk for hours on this topic. But I've given you a very holistic overview I hope that you understand from what I've said that there are simple things that we can all do to have a profound impact on our lives as individuals and the quality of lives of our family. I pray that the information that I've shared with you is something that will resonate deeply within your heart and your mind and you will leave here reflecting on these things because they are important. The God that we serve is a God who wants you to be whole in all aspects of your life, not just in your finances, 
not just in your home life, in your marriage, but also in the whole, in your physical well-being. And you, as individuals, all have that responsibility right there, right in your hands. Now, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to manage it? Are you going to be the ostrich that buries its head in the sand? Or are you going to open and say, look, I know what I need to do. I need to get my physical done. I have diabetes, I have high blood pressure, I have these other medical conditions, and I know that I need to change the way that I am doing things so that I can have a healthy, full life which God wants us to have in full abundance. I'm going to now open up the floor for questions that you may have associated with specific things that I may have spoken into or just general health-related questions. They don't have to be about diabetes or high blood pressure. And if you don't, ask, if you don't ask me any questions, I'm going to ask you questions. So you better <laughs> ask questions. <laughs> All right, let's go. Questions for me. Um, Dr. Cage, what should 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 my my glucose level level, level be at say at my age now? Right. Great um, question. 40, 49. Good. So age is only a number. The song about that, right? <laughs> so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how old you are. One time ago, we used to have all of these different numbers for all of these different age groups, and this group and that group, but nowadays, you know, it doesn't, you know. Your blood sugar on a fasting glucose should be less than 100 when you have a check. If your blood glucose is between 100 and 126, you are officially pre-diabetic, which means that you are at increased risk of the development of diabetes, but you do not have diabetes. If your blood sugar goes over 126, you are now classified as a type 2 diabetic. And so very far, very hard and fast rules, there's no gray zones, there's no such thing as a touch of sugar or a touch of pressure. Those are terminologies that we have created and we have done a great job of utilizing those, but either you are or you are not. Hope that answers your question. Any other questions? Yes, um, or no? I guess two questions are kind of related. Mm -hmm. um, fasting. How does fasting impact if you're not if you if you don't already have let's say you're not diabetic already? How does practicing fasting assist with helping to regulate the body's biochemistry, especially with with the issue of diabetes and things like that. And how does, you know, we we live in, in, this, in our cultural context here in the Bahamas, we love our traditional remedies. You know, we call it bush medicine, right? And every time you hear people talk, John, you don't need to take this, you don't need to take that, just boil yourself up some bush. Uh -huh. Whatever the, whatever the little concoction, man, you drink this, Oh, you, you know, I, I, really I hear them. I hear them all the time. I see them. They downtown. They peddling these stuff, these miracle cure alls. Sure. How does how does that play a role Great in terms question. of how our cultural psychology with relation to traditional medicine, and how does fasting, um, whether it be intermittent fasting or full fasting, does that help to mitigate some of the health issues related with hypertension and diabetes? Okay. So I'll take the second question first. That's an easier one to manage, and then we'll talk about the first question. So just to reiterate, the second question is about bush medicine. And so there are lots of medicines that are promoted as alternative medications that are used in the management of high blood pressure, diabetes, gout, colds, flus, fevers. I grew up on them, I grew up in Eleuthera. I can see my grandmother now beating the sour soft and uh, um, all of the various teas and things that she would make, catnip, that was a big one, obviously, things to give us every day, and aloe. 
so I think we must not throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's what I would say. I think there are definitely health benefits. Unfortunately, there is very little research that has been done associated with a lot of natural supplements that we actually have available. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. When I say that, what I mean is that you can't say, oh, all of the bush medicines are bad. But on the other hand, you can't say, okay, well, all of the medicines that as a physician I have available to me are bad and I'm not going to take any of those. I think there is room in the arena for both of them, okay? <clears throat> the second part of you, the second question that you have is one is associated with fasting. So I think, first of all, we have to be clear on what do we mean and what are we defining as fasting because people use fasting to mean a whole lot of different stuff. So let's talk about fasting. So when we talk about fasting in particular, what we're talking about from a medical point of view is basically just having water, nothing else. No smoothies with all of these <laughs> juices and fruits and everything inside of it. So I'll, t I'll give you an example uh, to illustrate my point. So I had a patient in last week who said, Doc, I'm, I'm on a cleanse now, I'm fasting. And I said, well, you know, what do you mean by that? What are you doing? And so she said to me, she said, oh, in the morning I have a smoothie and then I don't have anything else for the rest of the day. So I said, wow, what do you put in your smoothie? So she said, I put kale, I put spinach, I put banana, I put apple, I put strawberry, I put blueberries, and I put mango. I said, okay, let's just take a minute to process through what you just told me, all right? So what you've done is you are now getting a huge carbohydrate load of all of those fruits that you put into your smoothie for the day, which is probably giving you in the order of probably over 100 grams of carbohydrates just in that one drink. So you wonder why you're not losing weight wonder why you're feeling tired and fatigued all the time. So you have to be very mindful. So let's go back to definition. When we talk about intermittent fasting, or we talk about fasting from a medical point of view, what we're talking about is basically only water, okay? Nothing else. Now, there is an extensive amount of medical literature that is coming out on intermittent fasting, which is remarkable. And for intermittent fasting for our diabetics, for our pre-diabetics in terms of health and with glycemic control, which is blood glucose control. So why does it work? What is the rationale behind it? The rationale is very simple. When you put your body into a fasting state, there are neurochemicals and chemicals that are released in your body. These chemicals create an environment which decreases something called insulin resistance. So we know that as a population, we have a very high incidence of insulin resistance. And what that simply means is that your body, which is a, the pancreas inside of your abdomen, is producing too much insulin. It's constantly pushing out this insulin into your bloodstream because the cells inside of your body are not responding to the insulin the way it should. It's a lock and key mechanism. The cell is locked in order for the glucose to get inside of the cell. The insulin comes and attaches onto the surface of it. It opens up the channels and lets the glucose go inside. But what happens is that there's more and more insulin that has to be produced to get that cell to function to be able to do what it actually needs to do. We know from studies that intermittent fasting reverses that process. It decreases insulin resistance. It encourages weight reduction, weight loss, increases and decreases insulin resistance, thereby obviously decreasing the risk of high blood pressure, of diabetes, of high cholesterol. The list goes on and on and on. So I am a big proponent of intermittent fasting, even in patients that are diabetic. Yes, if you're diabetic, you can fast, but it needs to be done under the care of a health care professional. Because if you are doing intermittent fasting 
and you are taking certain types of medications that can cause you to have something called hypoglycemia or a low blood sugar, that can be deadly. Hypoglycemia can kill you just like that. And so it needs to be done in conjunction with your doctor, adjusting the dosing of your medications on the days that you are fasting, making sure that you're not taking medications that are gonna cause that blood pressure to go too low, and then monitoring your blood pressure. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, just as trauma can cause a person's blood pressure to go up, could it also cause a person's sugar to go up? Say, for instance, a car accident. Thank you for your question. So, anytime your body is in a very stressful state, whether it be that you are ill with a severe illness, for example, like COVID environment in which you live, or you're in a traumatic state, your body produces a chemical that is called cortisol. Cortisol is a steroid that is released inside of your bloodstream. And one of the effects of cortisol is that it increases your blood sugar, it increases your blood pressure, it increases your heart rate, it does all of these things to help your body to have enough to be able to get through whatever the event is that is going on. What is important to understand, however, is that this is very short-lived. This is not something that will last for an extended period of time. And once you have recovered from the illness or after that particular traumatic event that you may have had, within literally 30 minutes to an hour, your blood sugar should go back down to normal and your blood pressure should go back down to normal. It's not something that would be chronic and causing your blood pressure or your blood sugar to be persistently elevated. Other questions? Yes, sir. Cancer, okay. So I got convinced because I, I said, I literally was thinking at some point, oh, it must be the water. Maybe it's this type of water that they're drinking. And I try and figure it out. At the end of the day, and you, you can definitely advise, but I'm convinced it's the sugar. That's right. really, really good. So, um, you know, I would say that there is definitely a lot of medical evidence associated with the relationship between obviously high glucose diets or high carbohydrate diets and the development of cancers. But it's also important to understand that, you know, it's never one dimensional. We always are looking for the smoking gun. Everybody wants the one answer that's gonna fix everything and there isn't one answer. And so that is my word, caution, okay? Yes, sugars should be minimized in our diet, but also we know that high fat diets also increases our risk associated with cancers. I have a good friend, Greg, who is a PhD, who's doing work in uh, one of the large universities in the United States, 
looking at the BRCA gene, and the BRCA gene, as many of you would be aware, is the cancer gene, and we have one of the highest predispositions for in the entire world. And this is directly linked to the high incidence of breast cancer that we have in the Bahamas, particularly in young women. However, there's a broader thinking associated with the BRCA gene. And what is thought and is being studied now is indicating that there are triggers that turn on the BRCA gene. So say for example, my mother had the BRCA gene and she never developed cancer in her entire life. So far, so good. She's now uh, 87 and she's okay so far. Hopefully she'll be able to be that way. But you have another family that has the BRCA gene and they develop cancer in their family, breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer. The hypothesis that is being put forward now in the study that's being carried out on a large multinational level is looking at what turns on the BRCA gene so that there are people that then go on to develop cancer. And what the evidence appears to be is one, sugar, as you rightly pointed out, and two is a high fat diet. And those two factors contribute to the high incidence of cancers that we see within our country. And if we look at some of the other Caribbean countries that have a very similar dietary profile to us, they also have high, high risk of cancers. I would step back and say to you that, you know, you are never going to be able to prevent everything in life. But what you can do is you can mitigate the risk. And my challenge to all of you today is what are you going to do to mitigate your risk of the development of high blood pressure, of the development of diabetes, of the development of cancer? Are you willing and committed today and going forward to put your healthy seatbelt on? so that you are looking after the areas of your life that you know, because it's one thing to know, but it's a very different thing to action, and to actually make it as a part of a sustained decision-making that you make in your everyday life. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Fine. Good, okay. Yes, ma'am, and then I'll come to you. Okay. Um, Speaking about the plague method, I noticed you didn't talk about fruits. So can you elaborate on the role of fruits in the diet, especially, I guess, because they're naturally occurring sugars, and maybe there are some better fruits than others, but if you can elaborate. So sugar is sugar is sugar, no matter how you cut it, okay? So brown sugar, green sugar, blue sugar, white sugar, it's all sugar. If it's fruit, it's sugar, okay? Now, you must also appreciate that to some level, obviously the body needs some degree of sugars in order to be able to work. The brain has a blood-brain barrier and the brain only works on sugar. It doesn't work on anything else. That's its mechanism, that's how it does. So if your blood sugar was to go extremely low, you start to feel shaky, you start to feel weak, you start to get confused and eventually you will become comatose and could potentially die associated with having an extremely low blood sugar. Now, for the average person, that's not going to happen because we eat sugars. As it relates to a diet that is a fruit-based diet, there are high concentrations of sugars in fruit. And so, again, the word here is moderation, right? It's not all or nothing. Now, there are some people, our diabetic patients, for example, that we do not encourage to have fruit in their diet because it is a carbohydrate. Now, you can then figure out what is the portion of the carbohydrate that you are going to have. So dependent on your diabetes or dependent on your risk factors, you may limit the intake of carbohydrates in your diet, and fruit is a carbohydrate. But it's important to understand that even fruits have sugars in it. And so 
vegetables have very low sugar content, so you can get away, obviously, with a larger volume. You get easy satiety, so you feel full after you've had a meal, especially if you're combining that with, obviously, some type of protein that is gonna help in terms of balancing out your diet. Uh, just one minute, ma'am. This lady had a question, then I'll come to you. Okay. What I want to know, what level of stress, the, your stress level play with, um, um, with, um, with the cancer and with the diabetes and hypertension? Because you know, I can personally say I have all that, I have three, the combination. Right. And I know when I get stressed, or my body gets stressed, all I ever want is sugar. Right. And that's it. I don't. I don't want anything else but something really, really sweet. Right. So, I don't. Know. Right. So you, there are two parts to your question. Mm -hmm. The first part is obviously why does your body crave sugar when you're in a stressful environment? Mm -hmm. and so the reason is physiological. Is that what happens is when you are under a lot of stress, your body produces neurochemicals. These neurochemicals stimulate your hippocampus inside of your brain. Your hippocampus is a feel-good center. It makes you want to feel good. And one of the ways in which we feel good is by eating. And one of the choices that we make in terms of foods that we eat, the chocolate bar, or candy, ice cream, whatever it is that obviously lights up our taste buds. And wow, this is just the best thing that I've ever had. So that's the physiology of stress increasing those neurochemicals, acting on a part of the brain, and then your body is saying, okay, I'm gonna do this to be able to give me that sensation that I want. So that's a physical, a physiological piece associated with it. The other piece associated with the blood pressure, the blood sugar, <coughs> elevations associated with stress is that when your body, as I said earlier, is constantly in a high level of stress, these neurochemicals are constantly being produced and released inside of your bloodstream. As a result of the release of these neurochemicals, you increase your insulin resistance. As you increase your insulin resistance, you then subsequently predispose yourself more and more and more towards diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. So it all goes back to that basic lock and key mechanism. And when that lock and key mechanism is not working properly, things within the body start going awry. And so that is the physiology behind it. And that is also the psychology behind obviously stress and that craving that you get associated with sugars. Okay. I had another question. No, you can, you can okay. I'll come back to you, let someone else get a question in, and then I'll, yes ma'am? Okay, I was thinking about Charlie's question about food, and that he said that sugar, sugar, sugar is the main source of sugar, and so for someone who loves fruits, that would be me. I wanted to know, and I've used it as an aid to lose weight, I wanted to know then, what would, because then of course there was a suggestion that you have six fruits, um, I guess that's six fruits, not vegetables, or was it just six fruits per day? So my question then um, is what then would you be your food be, would be your suggestion for your daily consumption of fruits if I, I do right. I eat quite So I think it really depends on what your health objectives are. So I mean everybody, this is very personalized and very individual. So you know I can gen make general categories, but I can't speak specifically for you. So first of all, I think you have to appreciate that the food pyramid that was created was created by Kellogg's, the sugar industry, and that food pyramid is a waste of complete time. So throw that out the window. What you can look at, however, is obviously what is it that you're trying to achieve in your health as an individual to maximize the benefits. Now specifically, if we talk about carbohydrates inside of your diet, because that is really the question you're asking. Carbohydrates are carbohydrates are carbohydrates no matter how you cut it. It's a sugar. 
oats is full of carbohydrate. People eat oats in the morning and they think they're doing the greatest thing in the world and it's full of carbohydrates. And then you add sugar to it and then you add milk to it and then you add sweet milk to it. <laughs> Talk to me. You know, it's like, it's like uh, coconut water. You know, I mean, the latest craze is everybody's drinking coconut water, right? I had a patient in yesterday, blood sugar 385. I said, why is your blood sugar 385? Oh, I was told I should be drinking coconut water every day. Coconut water is sugar, all right? It's natural, but it's a sugar, and it has the same impact on your blood, your blood glucose. So if you are a diabetic, for example, we know that you should limit your carbohydrate intake. Your carbohydrate intake for the average person should be somewhere between 45 and 60 grams for every meal not more than that. Now, let's talk about fruit and the number of grams associated with carbohydrates. Half a banana is 15 grams of carbohydrates. Six grapes, those little beautiful green or black grapes that we enjoy, 15 grams of carbohydrates. A half of an apple, 15 grams of carbohydrates. Mango, and this one will make you cringe. <laughs> I know, right? You feel me? It's right. Delicious. Yeah. Full of sugar. So a quarter, quarter of a half of a mango is 30 grams of carbohydrates. Okay? So that's just to give you some idea of what you're up against when you talk about, obviously, fruits and you talk about carbohydrate intake. So bang for buck, if you are looking at weight reduction, if you're looking at blood glucose reduction, if you're looking at cancer reduction, your best bang for buck is to go with vegetables. Broccoli, cauliflower, the whole vegetable pile because you get low glycemic, low carbohydrates, but you get all the benefits associated with having those vegetables in your diet. And if you can tolerate them, raw vegetables are better than cooked vegetables because obviously you're not breaking down some of those chemicals which are so good, which are those antioxidants that you get from obviously having the raw vegetables. So we're going to come back up here. You had another question, and then we'll come to you, and then in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I was thinking about the, the medication. When I was diagnosed with hypertension at 25. Okay. And I went on this medication called Base Medic, mm -hmm. and I was on it for years, maybe right. like 30 years. Sure. And then all of a sudden, it didn't work anymore. And my blood pressure like just went out of control. Sure. So what my physician was doing is trying me with certain kinds of medication for like I guess it's most popular one now is Codiavan. Well, you know you have like one sixty. Well, I'm up to like three twenty. Right. Three twenty was not doing it for me. It was not bringing my blood pressure down at all. Sure. So he had to add um, and fifteen and fifteen. The fetapine, the calcium channel blocker. Uh -huh had to add like 120 milligrams to bring it under control. Sure. And it took almost like maybe three months for it to come under control. But I'm still at the same level. I'm still taking that same amount. So I mean, like, I don't even know what else to do, right. what else to do. You know what I mean? I'm trying to keep the stress level down. I'm trying to watch my diet, but you know, I don't always do, but I, right. I mean, I try. Um, and, and with the sugar, you know what I mean? With the sugar, what should you be using? Sugar or honey or you know what I mean? It's like a, it's like a mix. You know what I mean? It's confused, confusing to, to to say what is best for you, right? Or it's just a matter of taste. No, it's not a matter of taste. I mean, one is I think obviously healthcare has to be individualized, mm -hmm. and what I would encourage you is that if you've never seen a healthcare professional who's a specialist in diabetes, that's probably a good thing for you to do. Mm -hmm. So there are health educators or diabetes educators that work with patients with diabetes to help to control and regulate their blood sugar. 
and this is a multifaceted approach. My wife is a diabetes educator, so I know well the role of diabetes education as it relates to the adjustment and changes that are required in patients that may have high blood pressure, that's common. So it's nothing to do with the fact that the medication is not working any longer. It's to do with the fact that as you get, as you get older, your body has something which is called increased peripheral vascular resistance. And what that simply means is this. If you could imagine for one minute, if you have a four inch pipe with 20 pounds of pressure running into your house. And then all of a sudden the plumber comes along and he says, I'm gonna change this four inch pipe to a two inch piece of pipe. What's going to happen to the pressure inside of the flow of water into your house? It's going to increase. And so as we get older, the peripheral vascular resistance, which is our arteries become less compliant which is natural and happens to everybody. And therefore the blood pressure requirements change. The other factor is, as you get older, you become more insulin resistant. The more insulin resistant you become, the higher your blood pressure is gonna be, the more difficult it is going to be to be able to control your blood sugar. And so you have both of these variables that are now impacting your blood pressure and impacting your blood sugar. And so those are things that obviously require a multidisciplinary approach, a disciplinary approach, which is through working along with an educator and working along with your healthcare provider to make sure that obviously your blood pressure and your blood glucose is controlled. Just before I take the next question, I'm gonna throw something out to you. I'm gonna ask a question. Anybody have any idea what is the content of glucose inside of your bloodstream. Right now, normal blood glucose levels, total volume of glucose that you have or I have, I'm a non-diabetic, I'll use myself as an example, inside of my bloodstream. Give me some numbers. 10 teaspoons, one teaspoon, 20 teaspoons, a half a pound. What do you think? Charlene, I can call on you, what do you think? Cup. Cup, okay. One answer. I need three. Next. A pound. Uh, a pound. A pound. Next. Five, five teaspoons. Five teaspoons. One teaspoon in your entire blood volume right now. That's all you have. That's all I have. And that's enough for my body to do exactly what it needs to do. Isn't that incredible? And you talk about the power of God, right? That itself, right? And we sit and we consume sugars far beyond what our body requires. And right now, as a normal non-diabetic, I have one teaspoon of sugar, total content inside of my body. My body is functioning absolutely fine. Next question, right here. Yeah, you were talking about, um, there's a big debate in the world nowadays, and a lot of people is on different sides, and it's kind of gotten heads, but between plant -based, a plant-based diet and a traditional diet where people are consuming animal meat or, or food, uh, food from animals. Now, I'm not a vegetarian. I like meat, I like a good steak, I like ribs, I like all the things that, you know, a red-blooded Bahamian like me. <laughs> You know, I'm just being honest. Um, I'm putting on, you know, certain foods you put in front of me, I'm going to shout out. Um, I guess it's kind of twofold. The question is, what, what is what is really best for us as, as, as a society? A plant-based diet or a diet where we eat meat, but then we, like you said, one of the, your key words was moderating the level. Because I have friends who say, they only eat fish, they don't eat consumed meat, they don't eat red meat, or they don't eat chicken. You know, a lot of people talking about chicken because of how chicken is raised, there's, it's a, you know, it's a processed food. So, trying to, trying to get through, cut through all of that noise. All right, how much time do you have? <laughs> it's a big container conversation. The quick question, the quick answer. Too, But I'll give you a quick answer. My quick answer is that I think there is a balance to be had, 
right? And I think it really comes down to personal choice, mm. right? And so people have choices to make. We make choices every single day associated with what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, how we're going to look, how we're going to cut our hair, and what color we're going to put into our hair. I saw somebody yesterday with green hair in my office. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, but, you know, those are personal choices. But I can tell you one thing, and I've proven this time and time again through my medical practice over the last 20 plus years, is that we know that people who have a high plant-based diet have a lower likelihood of having diabetes, high cholesterol, and other cardiovascular complications. Now, does that mean that you can't occasionally have a steak, or occasionally have some pork chops and some ribs and those types of things? No, it doesn't mean that. But if those are things that are the bread basket items of your diet every single day, that is not what is considered balanced meal planning. And so I really think it goes back to moderation, it goes back to balance, it goes back to looking at all of the variables associated with what are you doing and how are you actually doing it. Yes, ma'am. It's interesting with all the smoothies, vegetables, the fruit, what is the problem we have with water? That's a great question. Well, it's the problem that we have with water. You see what I'm doing as I'm standing here? I don't know. I don't have a problem. I'm not claiming it. You know, I think people have just, you know, life is so interesting, right? I mean, you know, I, I look at my kids. So we don't have any sodas or juices in our house. That's just the way it is. Uh, but I think it's interesting in the fact that obviously people become habitual. We are creatures of habit, right? If you want a good spiritual practice, it doesn't happen just you wake up one day and say, oh, I'm going to pray and I'm going to have meditation, I'm going to read my Bible every day. No, it doesn't. You'll do it for a day or two, and then the next week you'll be completely off track. It's about creating healthy habits that are important for your life. And this is exactly what we're talking about. We're talking about creating healthy habits that are good for your physical well-being, your spiritual well-being, your social, your financial, and your emotional well-being. All five components that are important for your overall well-being. And they do not come by chance. They come because you are intentional and you are actively pursuing them as a path fullness, the fullness of what God has invited us into, which is to be complete. Yes, ma'am. So uh, the question is, are sugar substitutes good for your body? So the, que the answer to that question is that I would prefer if you didn't use sugar substitutes, but Sugar substitutes are better than using sugar. Yes, sir. What about it? Well, again, I think you have to look at the studies. If you look at obviously the actual med medical studies that were done, these were studies that were done in rats. They were done at extreme high concentrations. These rats were given 10,000 times the amount that any human being would ever consume in their entire lifetime, right? So again, you know, everything has to be put into context. What my message is, is that if you're gonna have anything, it's ideal to be on a good path, which is obviously low carbohydrates, high vegetable intake, having a balanced approach in terms of your overall health and well-being. And if your decision at the end of the day is that you're going to have a little bit of a sugar substitute rather than having sugar, honey, all, no, those are all sugars. You can't get away from that. Now, if you don't need those things in your diet, then don't have them. That's the best thing that you could possibly do because there are so many things that have sugars already inside of them 
and then return it around, and then add another. So last comment I'm going to make, and I know we're going to wrap up. So anybody, this uh, this is a good one. Anybody like Vitamol? Honestly, who is drinking Vitamol? Everybody is drinking Vitamol, right? You're shaking your head. Most people drink Vitamol at the home. Tell me, how many spoonfuls of sugar are in a Vitamol? <laughs> give me a give me I a think, number. I yeah, want about sixty-four grams of sugar per serving. Sixty-four grams of sugar per serving. And how many servings in a bottle? Two. Two. Give me a drum roll. Someone fill out a number. <laughs> Anybody? Twenty-four teaspoons of sugar in one bite of And on that note. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you to be here. Let's give it a round of applause. Dr. Gates, on behalf of uh, Reverend Burroughs and all of us here, we would like to thank you very much for you coming by. Pleasure. And letting us know more about diabetes and hypertension. I would like for all of, of you to please take your your meds okay because i am on meds too all right doc um i actually take cobaram and naturalist i used to take dioban okay for like about six years but it actually stopped you know it just wouldn't um work so i actually switched and then now that should work okay Doc, on behalf of the leaders here, the minister, Reverend Burroughs, congregation, Channel Board Chairman, Mr. Frank Jones, and myself, we would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Doc. <laughs> You're not tall. <laughs> you have to come up close. That's a serious camera match. You got a max only lands on that. Hey, Tara. My sister. I'll just pick her. I'll just Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everyone. Rev? Good night, everybody, and I just want to say thank you for each and every one of you who came out tonight. It is so good to see you out on a Wednesday night, on a hop night, like you say, Jay, hop night. But I hope that it was informative, instructive, and that you got something out of it. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Cates. Um, I think we're gonna have to invite you back, because, man, it was, it was really eye-opening because like you said, there are so many misconceptions about what we, sh sh what we should eat, what we should not eat, how we should go about it. Um, you know, anybody who knows me, I like Coca-Cola. I think I can like 12 grams of sugar like Coca-Cola. I, I, I read the labels, I see how many fans. I, I, I try to be disciplined with it. Um, my wife, we had a disagreement. She said, Coke ain't good for you. I said, no, people have been drinking Coke for years. They didn't kill nobody yet. <laughs> that ain't good advice to me. I just fool around here. But Dr. Case, I am so grateful for you coming out tonight and just, I know you're a busy man, and sharing your depth of knowledge on a whole uh, scope of things. And one of the things that I was just on my own anecdotal research you know, some of the biggest issues killing behaviors is we got high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and stroke. I think those are like the top five killers yeah. in here. And what's so interesting when you really look at it, it goes back to that plate that we all love to consume here in the Bahamas. And we all love food, but sometimes the food ain't loving us back, and it's about moderation. I, I don't want everybody to go cold turkey 
and stop eating peas and rice. You know, we don't want to put, you know, so, but if we could just take those small steps each day, and I think one thing that I try to do is the intermittent fasting. One of the things I try to discipline myself in my own uh, dietary way, I guess, is I usually stop eating around four or five o'clock in the evening. And I won't eat again until about six o'clock or seven o'clock the next morning. And the first, so just those simple things that we can do to really kind of help our health along. So thank you again, Dr. Cates. Really appreciate it. Let's give him one round of applause, please. And let's bring this. We can get in trouble because I. Here we got Dr. Kate talking with diabetes and sugar. I watched my wife walk in here with two boxes. of this talking to her. Don't get me in trouble. He's talking with diabetes and she walking in with Dr. Dose. Pray for me. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for all of your for all of your blessings, Father God. Lord, I just want to bring before you Dr. Cates, his family, his ministry, his life's work. Father God, in a time in which so many of our young, bright and gifted Bahamians are taking their talents to Canada and the United States and Europe and looking for greener pastures. I just want to lift him up and the many of our young Bahamians who are so gifted and talented, who decide and make that decision to come back here and enrich their own country. Sometimes we don't appreciate them the way we do, we should. But I wanna say thank you. Thank you for putting that spirit in him that he decided after his education was over in the United States and in London and in England, that he made the decision to come back here to this beautiful country called the Bahamas so that we can have a night like this when he's able to share his expertise. Continue to bless him and in his ministry, expand his business, and may he continue to be a light in this world. So God, we thank you for each and every one of those who have come here this evening, those persons who are joining us by social media. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with each and every one of us as we leave from this place and as we drive home to our respective homes, that you will guide and shield us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.